Russia returned to its tactics of destroying Ukrainian energy infrastructure, attempting to plunge Ukrainians into darkness. Ukrainians across the country endured a week of unprecedented combined aerial attacks. Meanwhile, as March marked the 10th anniversary of the illegal referendum in occupied Crimea, we reflect on political and ethnic persecution by the Russian occupiers. You're listening to the podcast Explaining Ukraine. The Explaining Ukraine podcast is produced by Ukraine World, an English language website about Ukraine. My name is Vladimir Jan Malenko, I'm chief editor of Ukraine World. I invite you to a regular conversation between my colleagues Anastasia Harasimchuk and Darya Sinhayevska, journalists and analysts at Ukraine World. They analyzed key events in and around Ukraine during the last week. Let me remind you that Ukraine World is brought to you by Internews Ukraine, one of the largest Ukrainian media NGOs. Let me also remind you that you can support our work at patreon.com slash ukraineworld. You can also support our volunteer trips to the front lines at paypal, ukraine.resisting.gmail.com. You can find these links in the description of this episode. Russia has intensified its aerial attacks on Ukrainian cities. It uses all possible means for its air strikes, from the strike UAVs to different kinds of missiles like cruise missiles, ballistic missiles or hypersonic missiles. These types of weaponry may sound familiar to you, but what is peculiar about the current situation that Russia has widened the types of missiles and weapons in general within each category. Uh, for example, Russia used new types of hypersonic missiles to, to, attack, to attack Kyiv. Since Ukraine has better air defense capabilities than it had the last year, um, Russians decided to widen this variety of, of airstrike means it uses. And uh, what is unfortunately as well that not all the Ukrainian regions have these air defense capacities to protect themselves from ballistic and hypersonic missiles attacks. Russia is well aware of that. Moreover, it drew lessons from its previous mistakes. It also conducts active reconnaissance actions to find the ways to bypass Ukrainian air defense. And it uses new tactics of attacks. And even though uh, the Ukrainian air defense and armed forces managed to shoot down the majority of air targets, still those which reach the air aim um, cause huge destructions. What is peculiar about this wave of attacks is that Russia returned to the tactics of destroying the energy infrastructure of Ukraine. On the night of the 22nd of March, Ukraine endured the most massive air attack on its energy infrastructure since the beginning of the full-scale invasion. Indeed, the scale of destruction as well as geography of the attack was immense. Almost all the regions were targeted. And when we talk about the destructions, the scope of destructions, um, a huge number of uh, power generation and transmission facilities were damaged or completely destroyed. And here we talk about thermal and hydroelectric power plants, substations, transmission and distribution grids. Um, so at this attack, Russia used 151 mil uh, means of aerial attack. And as a result, uh, the main uh, gener power generation producer, DTEC, lost 50% of its generation capacities. According to the estimates of uh, specialists in the power in the energy sphere, it will take months to restore the uh, energy uh, capacities of Ukraine. And in some cases, it may take uh, more than a year. Also, Ukrainians remembered uh, what the word blackout means. So after this immense attack uh, in in a big amount, in a big number of regions uh, like Odessa, Donetsk, Dnipropetrovsk, Sumy, Kirovograd, Kharkiv and Poltava oblasts, uh, people endured, suffered from emergency blackouts. And uh, unfortunately, after this big attack, there were subsequent attacks on uh, of smaller scale, but still they were aimed at the energy infrastructure. So uh, they destabilized the situation even more. Um, but despite uh, the uh, this 
terrible consequences and huge burden on the energy uh, infrastructure of Ukraine, the power engineers managed to stabilize the situation. So currently, um, currently, just several re- several regions face uh, face these blackouts, uh, emergency emergency or stabilization. Uh, however, uh, taking into account the scope of destructions and damages. This strike um, might have long-term consequences, and the energy specialists tell about the negative consequences for the energy system of Ukraine exactly in summer. However, uh, Ukrainian uh, services do everything possible to cope to cope with this situation, and the repairing works are ongoing. And what is important to note here. Uh, that that um, the situation is under control now, and even though the strike was of unprecedented scale, the majority of Ukrainians do not uh, suffer from power outages. And another strength and uh, like strengthening point uh, of Ukraine as an energy um, securitizer actor, I would say, is that we are now connected with European uh, ENSO Air system, that means the synchronization of power grids of Ukraine and Europe that unites us uh, as one of the essential level, and this level is uh, energy sector. This means that, uh, well, Ukraine, we know, had terminated the the last connection with uh, Russia's uh, um, energy system that uh, was like from Soviet times, and uh, we now um, know that uh, this synchronization allows us to significantly increase the rel- reliability of operation of the Ukrainian power system and ensure security of electricity supply to uh, our consumers. That's true, and this factor was indeed extremely important in the terms of coping with the uh, with the um, consequences of this attack. And it is also important to note that actually Ukraine was preparing uh, for the attacks on its uh, infrastructure, and the defense constructions were created uh, to protect the energy facilities better. And the power engineers also. Uh, piled the necessary amount of details um, and components uh, to to repair what was damaged. Uh, so uh, as as I've already told, um, nowadays, like uh, about a week after attack, just several regions face uh, some problems with electricity, among which are Odessa Oblast and Kharkiv Oblast. And I reside, I myself reside in Odessa, so uh, I know this situation from inside. Currently, we have stabilization blackouts, which means that there is the schedule according to which we know uh, when there will be power outages and we can plan our days accordingly. Uh, But the most difficult situation is in Kharkiv because almost all the generation facilities were destroyed there. Uh, But what is, again, what is extremely important to note here is that uh, power engineers in the region made something akin to miracle because despite this heavy, severe destructions, as of now, the uh, like 80% of um, households are already with electricity. So we can just admire and uh, praise the immense efforts and courage of power engineers and specialists in this sphere. Um, I also would like to mention the incident uh, the incident that took place as a result uh, of uh, the attack, which could have become a man-made, man-made disaster of unprecedented scale. Uh, during that attack at night uh, on the 22nd of March, Russia hit the Dnipro hydroelectric power plant, the biggest hydroelectric power plant in Ukraine. Uh, so the facility sustained eight hits. They were heavy damages, and now the hydroelectric power plant doesn't fully operate, and specialists say that it will take years to fully restore it. As the result of this attack, uh, as the result of the damage caused to the 
equipment uh, in the power plant, the oil products got into the Dnipro River, uh, which is actually a huge scale of water pollution. But it's a huge and extreme luck that um, despite those heavy damages, the dam of the Dnipro hydroelectric power plant uh, wasn't destroyed. And uh, currently the overall situation is under control and there are no risks of the dam breakthrough, which is a big uh, relief for Ukraine and entire Europe. So um, just let's think why Russia... Uh, restore to these tactics uh, again, and it happened not in winter, but exactly now. Uh, According to the Institution for the Study of War, uh, Russia decided to launch this kind of attack exactly now because um, Ukraine faces the lack of uh, ammunition and lack of uh, missiles, including for the air defense uh, capabilities, air defense system. Uh, So, uh, in face of this situation, when uh, Ukrainian air defense capabilities are weaker than they were, uh, it was a good, let's say, good chance for Russians to cause this heavy damage. According to the analysts of this uh, institute, um, these attacks on energy infrastructure might be not the last ones, and Russia might continue Uh, continue to conduct these kind of attacks. And uh, one of the main targets here was uh, not only uh, like terrorizing the Ukrainian population. Uh, Amid the amassed weapons production in in Ukraine, amid the um, intensive development of defense industry complex, these attacks on energy infrastructure uh, had an aim to undermine the defense industry complex operation. So it was like one of the main tasks of uh, of Russians uh, so that Ukraine wouldn't manage to grow and develop uh, its defense military complex further. And, um, of course, uh, terrorization of Ukrainian population is not the least aim, least important aim for Russians. Uh, they are trying to destabilize situation inside Ukraine and uh, these like problems with providing uh, yourself with the basic means like uh, electricity, water, heating, etc. Uh, according to Russians, might cause a certain kind of negative processes within the country. But um, it's a huge miscalculation because even though Ukrainians are facing these difficulties and they are under the constant threat, uh, still Ukrainians remain resilient and they understand who their enemy really is. And what strikes the most is this trend that we can observe. So um, we know that this attacks on energy infrastructure is not the first in times of not only uh, this big war since 2014, but also before that with uh, the points of uh, terrorizing Ukrainian society and uh, blackmailing um, authorities to achieve what uh, Kremlin wants. But the Ukrainian power system is interconnected with the power system of Moldova. So if you recall the attacks of 2022, they were also a destabilizing factor in Moldova's internal uh, political situation. There were still manipulations of Russia gas supplies to Moldova connected to the uh, volumes of electricity generated by a Russian-owned company in uh, the unrecognized region of Transnistria, which is used for Moldova's needs. And we also remember that protests in the country were l- related to Russia's destabilization of gas markets and power um, outrageous resulting from damage of the Ukrainian system. And at that point, Russia was trying to change the government in Moldova to one of their liking so that Ukraine receives another unfriendly state on its borders. Now, Moldova switched to European gas via Ukraine to reduce its dependence on Russian gas and um, the massive attacks that you nice to described are oriented on blackmailing of Ukrainians and cutting down capacities of Ukrainian cities to maintain themselves. 
we can overall see that Russia has become more active for a number of reasons. Uh, they are very concerned about the operations of the intelligence service of Ukraine. And there is information that the buildings of the main intelligence directorate and the foreign intelligence service could have been uh, targeted. Obviously, our special services are quite active and create a lot of problems for the enemy. And to some extent, um, this is a recognition of how effective uh, the Ukrainian intelligence community works. This is a recognition that they are extremely active, conducting operations that cause uh, these troubles. And uh, later on, we'll uncover uh, more details about that. To take revenge, Russia does best it can fighting against civilians. We know stories from our frontier cities. And to terrorize the civilian population of Kharkiv, the enemy uses S-300 missiles with a range of up to 350 kilometers with a ballistic trajectory that reduces the chances of being shot down by Ukrainian air defense systems. So we see this um, different patterns of attacking. For example, Kiev remains uh, the main symbolic, politic, strategic um, aim for uh, Russian occupiers. And those cities that uh, borders or somehow close to the occupied territories, for example, um, Odessa and Mykolaiv, if, if we talk about uh, ballistic missiles that were launched from uh, temporarily occupied Crimea, or Kharkiv and Sumy that suffers uh, um, such massive number of barrages per day that you can um, shock uh, any 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 a um, correspondent, any journalists that were there, and when they return, they, uh, well, basically, um, not in a good way, um, astonished by how brutal this regime could be with waging war against those who uh, can't protect themselves because they are non-combatants, they are civilians. Uh, and circling back, the Russian Federation has large stockpiles of these missiles, up to two 1,500, and their shelf life is up to 30 years. Therefore, the Russians are faced with a choice, either to dispose of the missiles spending money from the budget or to use them to hit frontline cities. This is why the occupiers are using them to hit Kherson, Kharkiv, and Zaporizhia. And what is also important to mention here that even though Russia has huge piles of ammunition, its own ammunition, like back from Soviet times, uh, we also should mention that um, it gets it gets as like huge loads of ammunition from its um, from its allies, like North Korea. And there was information that North Korea has already transferred. 10,000 containers with ammunition to Russia. And there were also already uh, cases when the North Korean ballistic missiles were used against Ukrainian cities. So that is something to keep in mind while we are talking about the allies' ties and the effectiveness of uh, supplies. While Ukraine faces the problems with, with getting what it needs, Russia with its partners within the axis of evil, have this effective cooperation and gets what it needs in not just sufficient, but in huge amounts. So the situation is indeed difficult and um, we face these tragedies of destruction and loss of lives every day. And we live in this negative context, but still we do not give up and uh, this negative context is not the only one we live in. We are trying to focus on the positive side of the of the issue. And, and now it's the moment to shift to more positive developments. And here I mean the successful special operations by defense forces of Ukraine that were aimed at, at destruction of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Yes, and basically uh, I will focus on several of them because uh, um, there, there is something to tell about. On 24th March, the defense forces attacked with a Neptune missile the landing ship Konstantin Olshansky, which the Russian occupiers stole from Ukraine in 2014 during the annexation of Crimea. Uh, the Ukrainian military also hit the Russian reconnaissance uh, ship Ivan um, 
horse and this sheep had been in Sevastopol for nine years. Russians began dismantling it for spare parts and looting it. But in the 10th year of the war, the occupiers realized that they were running out of large ships. So they decided to restore Konstantin Olshansky within a year. And our Navy spokesman, Dmitro uh, Plantinchuk, added that the extent of damage to the ship is currently being determined, but it's definitely not combat ready. The Russian large uh, assault ship Azov and Yamal, which were hit the day before, will also uh, not be able to carry out combat missions in the near future, as will the Ivan Hurs uh, ship. And Ukraine has upgraded its Neptune missile, so that it can now operate in a surface-to-surface mode. So basically, uh, these missiles have already been used against many targets. In particular, they attacked uh, the uh, cruiser Moskva and destroyed the S-400 anti-aircraft missile system, which is called Triumph. So um, Ukraine is on its way to upgrade what we have and uh, finding means of deoccupying uh, our territories. According to um, InfoNapalm, the Yamal large assault ship took part in the annexation of Crimea, and the Azov large amphibious uh, assault ship rarely took part in uh, you know, military exercises or any, let's say, international voyages. More often, the Russians liked to show it off. For example, it was used for a film about the construction of the Novorossiysk naval base. But uh, what um, draws our attention is that Ivan Hur's ship um, was designed for reconnaissance, and there are only two ships of this design in the Russian Navy. And the main task of it is electronic warfare, communications, um, fleet management, and initially it was supposed to join the Russian Pacific fleet, but it was decided to uh, send... Uh, send it to the Black Sea to replace the uh, sunken ship Leman, which also was uh, th- this um, the ship with such aims like electronic warfare and uh, like communications um, and, and, and other uh, things like that. And the official task of this uh, ship is to ensure the security of the Turkish Stream and Blue Stream pipelines. However, its designers intended it to be a flagship for, you know, like network centric warfare and to coordinate the actions of air and ground forces. Solely, it can like provide command and control of troops and coordinate the actions of aviation and ground forces. In addition, it has um, more modern equipment, let's put it in such way. So even the temporary loss of the ship will affect the Black Sea fleet's ability to perform various tasks. And uh, in previous episodes, we uh, delved deeper into uh, what tasks the Black Sea fleet uh, can cope with now and uh, which tasks are out of their control. So basically, point by point, uh, by each operation of our intelligence service, we see how uh, Crimea, for example, is getting closer and closer to uh, its uh, origins, to Ukraine's control. And we see the um, overall idea of Crimean Peninsula is um, somehow um, moved forward by Russian regime as uh, as a territory that belongs to Russia. But um, what Russia is doing is trying to colonize it um, the, this process has several dimensions, but the non-recognition of Ukrainians as a separate nation that um, believes uh, in there that um, like its sovereignty of, of the state and uh, its Ukrainian Ukraine's decision what what type you know of power there should be not uh, it should not be brought uh, uh, by Russians and uh, we see this thread in the speeches of Russian propagandists on how Crimea is important for Russia, but basically because of military mean, uh, means and with military purposes. So uh, I guess now it's time to pay more attention in our episode for this particular topic. Yes, touching upon the 
topic of Crimea, for our team, March has been a month with Crimea and Crimean Tatars in particular in focus. Ten years ago, on the 16th of March, the legal pseudo referendum took place in the peninsula, and that uh, it finalized the occupation of Crimea by Russian forces. Since then, the non-Russian uh, population of Crimea has become subject to politically and ethnically motivated persecutions, especially uh, when it comes to Crimean Tatars. So Crimean Tatars are actually indigenous population of the peninsula, and we can um, find their roots there since the 12th century. Crimean Tatars had their own state uh, in the Crimean Peninsula. It was called Crimean Khanate. But in 1783, the Russian Empire came there and destroyed the Crimean Tatar state. And since then, the occupation of the peninsula started. So it faced like almost two centuries of uh, occupation by Russian Empire. Then there was the Soviet occupation, and now it is occupied by the uh, current Russian Federation. What is important to note in this context that um, these occupational activities and um, well-adjusted Russian ethnic policy led to artificial change of ethnic makeup of the population. And when we talk about the 60% of Russians living in the peninsula, we should keep in mind that it was created artificially and uh, it doesn't have anything in common with, with the indigenous population of the peninsula. So the Russians artificially created these conditions, uh, deporting and um, eradicating the local population of Crimea. And I had an honor to talk with Tamila Tasheva, the permanent representative of the president of Ukraine in, in Crimea, about what is actually going on with the non-Crimean population of the peninsula. And uh, since the occupation in 2014, the persecutions have started and they uh, became much more severe and widespread, widespread uh, already after the full-scale invasion in 2022. And now there, uh, there are 214 individuals who are persecuted uh, under the pretext of Russian repressive law. So we are, calling, we are talking about these sham uh, legal persecutions. And out of this number of people, of this amount of people, out of 214 Crimean cases, uh, 135 persecuted are Crimean Tatars. And they face these full charges of extremism. Uh, these people, um, Ukrainians, and to a greater extent Crimean Tatars, uh, are being killed. They, there are cases of enforced disappearances. And um, what has become even more acute after the full-scale invasion, uh, in violation of international humanitarian law, Russia conscripts to its army the population of the occupied territories. So uh, people, Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar people uh, in the, on the peninsula are facing this forced mobilization. And now uh, the bigger uh, number of Crimean Tatars uh, have been leaving the peninsula. They, they, they are leaving their home homeland and the entire families are leaving it. And the Ukraine calls it hybrid or quiet deportation. Like uh, when, if in the 20th century, the Stalinist regime committed genocide against Crimean Tatars, deporting them, uh, to Central Asian countries, loading them into freight cars. Now Crimean Tatars are driven out of uh, the peninsula because of these persecutions, repressions, and forced mobilization. Um, when we talk about rights of non-Russian population there, we also should keep in mind that uh, all these spheres of life are under Russian control, even if we talk about religion. When it comes to orthodoxy and Christianity in general, the uh, Russian patriarchy is in charge of everything. But when we come, when we talk about Muslims, um, they are also 
uh, are under effective Russian control. And the religious administration of Muslims of Crimea are in charge of uh, religious affairs of Muslims. And um, this body currently is also under the control of Russian special services. This process didn't uh, start, um, didn't happen immediately. Like it was the whole process of subjugating this body, and the religious uh, leaders of uh, of Muslim population of Crimea, uh, they were uh, blackmailed, they were threatened, and that's how uh, Russians forced them to collaboration. And uh, talking again, talking about those false persecutions um, and uh, charges. Uh, against uh, Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar population. Um, as Tamila Tasheva told, Russians decided that uh, with the occupation of the territory, they can just appropriate the population of the peninsula. And um, the problem is that uh, Ukraine, neither Ukraine nor international community can do uh, can take um, effective steps to help and to assist uh, local population to protect themselves against uh, against Russian persecutions. First of all, these people who are persecuted, they are civilians. And uh, according to the international law, um, Ukraine just cannot include these people into the list of exchanges. Uh, that's the first point. The second point is that Ukraine doesn't have Russian civilian hostages to uh, to swap uh, to, to to conduct these these changes. Uh, so uh, there are no legal tools actually to force Russians release our our political prisoners. Uh, so um, the the actions are actually limited, and the only uh, things uh, we as a country can do and our partners is. Keep the world informed about what is going on, not to let uh, forget about those people and to somehow um, prevent tortures and other illegal uh, things that could happen to, uh, to our prisoners. What is alarming in this situation is that um, Russia considers um, the population of Crimea as their own citizens. And even if people um, residing here didn't get the Russian documents, they are still considered to be Russian citizens by Russian occupation authorities. And even those who do not live uh, on the territory of uh, the peninsula. And uh, here, very telling is the case of Linie Omerova. Uh, she is a young Crimean Tatar woman. She wasn't uh, residing in Crimea, but she had her father there. So in 2022, she went to Crimea to visit her father, and she was the only person uh, in the bus who didn't have Russian documents. That is why she was detained by the Russian uh, border uh, officials and special forces, exactly uh, under the pretext of not having Russian documents. And then she was detained under the pretext um, of... Uh, Espionage, so she is falsely accused of espionage and she is under the threat of being detained for long years in Russia. So you can read much more about the current state of Crimean Tatars uh, in, uh, on the peninsula and what Ukraine and international community do or can do uh, to assist, uh, assist this population in our article, which was recently published on our platforms. And I also would like to um, invite you to read several more materials uh, that were written our colleagues about the Crimean topic. Uh, our colleagues, journalists uh, Nika Krychovsk and Elizaveta July um, wrote wonderful articles. Uh, the first one is about key facts uh, about Crimean Tatar population. So about their roots, about their peculiarities. So you can uh, find out um, very interesting details and um, like the truth about history of uh, Crimea and Crimean Tatar population. And uh, our colleague Elizaveta July collected and retold a story of a Ukrainian writer, Eugenia Hanova, uh, who made a book uh, compiled of Crimean Tatar's uh, family's stories, personal stories. 
um, she was um, our uh, colleague was present at the presentation of the book herself and she managed to talk to the author of this book so it's a very interesting take and um, you can find out more about the author of this book about the stories from this book themselves and um, you can uh, read about uh, several uh, real life characters of that book so we are inviting you to visit our platforms and to uh, get familiarized with our materials about Crimea and Crimean Tatars. Indeed our colleagues did a brilliant job and uh, um, I fully agree with Nastya that uh, it worth attention and worth time reading it and the another dimension that I guess some how and sometimes is being overlooked is the dimension of uh, neo-colonial aspirations of Russia, this dimension of colonization of identity. Because what you said, Nastya, about that uh, Russia considers um, Crimean Peninsula and um, residents who live there as their citizens, um, even uh, though some might not have like Russian documents, uh, we see this long history that firstly Russia has banned the Majlis, the main political body of the Crimean Tatars. In 2021, the leaders of this um, of the Majlis were either arrested or exiled, and the first deputy of it, Nariman Jalalov, the most powerful voice of the Crimean Tatar people, was also imprisoned for 17 years for his participation in the Crimean Platform Summit on returning Crimea to Ukraine, and after. The Russian occupation of Crimea, only 3% of children can learn the Crimean Tatar language, and there are no Ukrainian schools left at all. The Russians brought in weapons, soldiers, and reactivated military units to militarize the peninsula. As I have already mentioned, um, the uh, greatest importance of Crimean Peninsula to Russia is the military one. And around a thousand missiles have been launched from Crimea. The Russians have returned it into, um, like, it's it, it it turned it into a platform for their aggression. And uh, Russia is working for a third time to transform Crimea's demographics. So we know that before the first annexation of Crimea in the 18th century, 95 percent of the population of the Crimean Peninsula were Crimean Tatars, but uh, this year has now decreased to 13%. Then we have the deportation of 1944, and today's efforts are also the process of Russian colonization. Also, when thinking about um, Crimean Peninsula, I um, recall this stance that literature is artistic way of living through events and communicate them with wider public. And I was astonished by the work of Svetlana Tatar, uh, Taratorina, who, uh, who is the author of the novel House of Salt. And uh, she is um, a Crimean itself, and uh, she couldn't start writing a novel immediately after the annexation of Crimea in 2014 because uh, this event became a family tragedy. And uh, then in 2018, um, he, she had two goals. On the one hand, she wanted to understand what happened to Crimea and why Russia had such an easy time annexing the peninsula. And on the other hand, uh, she wanted to find her Crimean identity and understand the history of Peninsula. So I guess this motive of uncovering the identity, of researching one's self-identity in this mosaic um, history, uh, uh, this long history of repression of uh, Crimean Tatars by Russian regimes, um, is, um, is now alive and... Um, each and every person who has this roots, uh, who has this uh, curiosity of finding out what what happens to Crimean Peninsula now and what happened back back then, back in, for example, 18th century, um, should should take this as a goal of uncovering the truth. And the novel and you, Dasha, you you also reminded me of uh, while talking about the culture, you actually reminded me of the instance uh, of uh, like let's say attack on the cultural heritage uh, of Crimean Tatars, and uh, it was told by Tamila Tasha. Mm -hmm. 
like there is this unique monument uh, to Crimean Tatar culture and history. It is Bakhchisarai Khan's palace. And now Russia is doing everything to destroy it. So under the pretense of reconstruction, it's actually rebuilding uh, this palace. So, uh, so that the cultural code and its uh, historical value is being destroyed. And Russians are doing it uh, to deprive the Crimean Peninsula of its real, of its uh, real phase, the Crimean Tatar phase. Uh, so w- what was being done back in the 18th century and in uh, the 20th century uh, is being continued and um, like uh, the world is losing its cultural heritage. The world is losing the truth about it. And uh, again, talking about the rights of Crimean Tatars, I also recall the episode uh, from the Evgenia Hanova's book. Uh, she mentioned the case of uh, Gulnara, and uh, Gulnara recalled her uh, childhood years when she was studying at school, and um, to share a place with her classmates, uh, to sit next to her in school, her classmates had to get permission from their parents. Otherwise, the teachers wouldn't let the other children share space with Crimean Tatars. So uh, Russians, Russian regimes, different kinds of Russian regimes were not just, um, were not only destroying culture and eradicate real history of the peninsula. Uh, they were discriminating and humiliating people under the uh, the ethnical uh, on on the ethnical grounds. And it's especially cruel towards children. So this disregard of dignity and uh, personal dignity of these people was so widespread. And these are actually painful pages of Ukrainian Tatar's history. It's painful, yes, but um, I would rather say that the Russian annexation is only a moment in the huge timeline of the history of the real Crimea. Um, it's painful. It it's it, it covers and uh, goes along with the uh, stories of uh, people, the tragedies of their families. But um, it's only a moment, and um, uh, I, I hope and I know that uh, in like for for a while, but I- in some time, it will be back under Ukraine's control, and uh, we can we would be able, you know, to uncover, to reestablish traditions, uh, to help reestablish this tradition uh, by Crimean Tatars and. Uh, all these deportations and settlement of others by Russian authorities um, have led to people not knowing who they are and they need to find their identity. And here, uh, another, you know, like m- metaphoric motive is the fairy tale of the golden cradle. Basically, it says that there is the hidden golden cradle in the Mount Basman is a symbol of peace and tranquility in Crimea and that whoever finds it will have power over the land. However, uh, the tale itself says that uh, it is a symbol of prosperity while has not been found, and then peace will prevail. Uh, Symbolically and uh, symptomatically for Russians, in uh, 2015, Crimean Gauleiters hilariously presented Putin with this golden cradle, saying here's power over Crimea, but... Again, Lee, this myth calls for fighting for one's land. So I guess the metaphor of searching for the golden cradle retains the pathos of hope for the future and for our generations. And um, again, Lee, we see these patterns of Russia forming this um, excess of evil with other authoritarian and totalitarian regimes for uh, changing world order based on rule with our world on uh, order based on power and we know that um, just a couple of days ago um, isis militants uh, responded in a way for the blood of muslims uh, as they say in afghanistan chechnya and uh, syria in krakow city hall near moscow and um, um, 
What is important here is that Islamic State militants are Sunnis. By the way, so is the occupied Ichkeria, or Chechnya, as uh, Russia calls it. So solidarity with the enslaved Caucasian people is another reason of hatred of ISIS, of the Kremlin and its uh, sympathizers. And here builds up an eye-catching uh, trend. We know that Iran is Russia's main partner in creating the Middle East conflicts, uh, including the war in Israel, and the Iranians are overwhelmingly shit. And it is sometimes difficult to know whom they hate more, Americans or Sunni Muslims. So um, inside this, what, what uh, I'm trying to say that inside this um, radical far movements, um, movements of aggression and uh, terror, there are also, you know, some cleavages. And Moscow and Tehran are jointly supporting Syrian dictator Assad. And we remember that the war in Syria began in um, 2011 with protests against Assad's dictatorship with ISIS took advantage of it, sizing uh, about a third of Syrian territory and four um, and 40 percent of Iraq. And then Assad called for help from the Russian army, Hezbollah and uh, Iran, and the Islamic State uh, was almost destroyed. Uh, the whole world knows uh, about the tragedy of two million city of Aleppo, uh, which the pro-Assad coalition um, besieged and destroyed with bombs, chemical weapons and starvation. Sometimes um, it, it is referred to as uh, another analog of what Russians did in Mariupol. And uh, we know that the day before in the morning, Russia launched a massive attack on Ukraine using uh, 90 missiles of various modifications and 60 drones. So uh, Russia can use this attack and uh, is trying to accuse Ukraine um, um, and, you know, Ukraine's alleged involvement as a pretext for further escalation of this war. And... Uh, the West understands this. Basically, British um, finance minister Jeremy Gant said that the Kremlin was creating a sort of a smokescreen of propaganda around the attack in order to defend the invasion of Ukraine and mobilize more resources. But we need to uh, understand clearly that both ISIS and Russia are terrorist sort of regimes, regimes of power. And Basically, when uh, Putin says from the tribute that basically the, this uh, t terrorist attack is cruel, uh, it's not appropriate in our world, we have to see what the Russian dictator did um, in Ukrainian cities like Mariupol, uh, Sum, Kharkiv, Mykolaiv, Odessa, uh, all that barrages carried out, all those uh, cities and their identity vanished out. So... Mm, neither of them, I mean, ISIS or uh, Russia, um, are good because they are, are terrorists and they are waging this uh, actions of aggression. Mm, but we mm, have to understand, uh, you know, who are we talking about? Because a uh, Russian president and its supporters, basically the Russians, um, they all are involved in uh, terrorism uh, against Ukraine. So there are no good terrorists. Uh, either we talk about ISIS or Russia. And what is shocking about this attack is that Russia is exploiting uh, the tragedy of its people to uh, false, falsely accuse Ukraine and, uh, as you, Dasha, Dasha said, to justify its terrorist attacks on Ukrainian cities. But what is also worth mentioning here is that actually Russia was warned about the possible terrorist attack. The uh, Western, uh, namely the American intelligence services, warned Russia about the possible terrorist attack. Uh, and the uh, reaction of Russian leaders was actually uh, quite unexpected. They, um, uh, the Russian leader told that that's actually how the Westerners were trying to destabilize situation within Russia. Uh, so uh, I don't know if it was on purpose or it was just negligence, but the Russian authorities didn't pay due attention to this warning and did nothing to prevent uh, this attack. 
And instead of focusing on it, on its internal security, like it kept focusing its actions on terrorist actions against Ukraine. This was a podcast explaining Ukraine by Ukraine World, an English language website about Ukraine. This was a regular conversation between Anastasia Hersemchuk and Daria Senhayevska, journalist and analyst at Ukraine World, who analyzed key events in and around Ukraine during the last week. My name is Volodymyr Yermolnko, a Ukrainian philosopher, journalist and chief editor of Ukraine World. Let me remind you that you can support our work at patreon.com slash Ukraine World. And you can also support our volunteer trips to the front lines at paypal.ukraine.resisting.gmail.com. Stay with us and stand with Ukraine.